As was addressed in one of the previous contemplations named Ash Wednesday, there is already, and there will be further inevitable and truth-aligned revelations, removing and burning guises, masks or personas. This is the culmination of a build-up of shadows, or demons if that's your preferred word, that emerged from identification of the original living essence with a false guise or persona. This is not to say that no personality mask should be worn. That would make interaction with the realm nearly impossible. What it implies is that although one wears that guise to have a place of reference and communication with others and the world, or if you prefer, while on stage, one should know that one is not the mask being worn and that it is only needed for realm interaction. This period of uncovering of guises and exposure of the naked nature of what or who is behind each of them is unavoidable and has certainly occurred several times before. So much so that the shadows, whose greatest defining attributes are hatred for their reflector or creator and an unshakable memory that stems from it, have been preparing for a long time to try to weather that unavoidable phase. How? One of the ways was explained in the previously mentioned presentation called Ash Wednesday, which is the temptation to place an ephemeral mask over the persona that is already worn naturally, so that when the exposure and consequent burning of guises comes to pass, it will be that ephemeral mask that will be destroyed, and not the actual identification with the false persona that was there before. In fact, by burning the ephemeral artificial mask placed over it, the identification with the false persona will tend to be reinforced, as it feels that it has just been saved from a tyrannic muzzle and so has been validated. Another way, complementary to the first, is to create expectations for the script that can then be falsely delivered as a plot twist attempting to wrest any further observation and contemplation into our souls as we seek our true essences. This second method, which is the creation and exploitation of expectations for the personas that essences identify as, is always founded upon hoaxes. These hoaxes are almost always adulterations through details of true myth outlines as was contemplated upon in both the presentations named Stories, Myths vs. Hoaxes, and Stories, Outline vs. Details. The natural therapeutic effect performed on the realm's mind, and consequently on each of us, fractally, is as follows. One is in a state of sin. Replace this word for another that you may feel being more adequate if you prefer which is, at the same time, a dance and a conflict between pride and shame. For instance, those who are overly proud and bear no shame will inflict and use shame on their opposite others to feed the parasitic pride they identify with. In the same measure, those who are overly shameful will deliver and reinforce pride onto their counterparts to feed the parasitic shame or guilt. Note that guilt is just a variant of shame, as it depends on it. This is a dance because both need each other, but it is also a conflict because both loathe each other as well. To better explain it, I will try to use allegory. Imagine a being who saw itself as perfect. Then it was put into a context where its shameful imperfections were made visible to all parts of it via shadowy reflections. If it still identifies as perfect, even when shown evidently by context that it is not, then pride emerges and takes it over. Given that the shameful shadows depend on the pride of the one reflecting them, the identification with that overwhelming pride will only strengthen them and their opposing hatred for the one who made them what they are, by opposite reflection, like the image in a mirror. Moreover, the one possessed by pride 
will tend to deny that the reflections are its own image, being shameful as they are, while it is convinced that it is supposed to be perfect. This causes that each obstacle or hassle caused by its reflections is seen as an attack by the colloquial them. That is, that the problem comes not from its own actual nature reflected in the mirror of the world, only hidden from it through the denial of pride, but from an external enemy acting completely independently as an attacker. This reveals a sickness in the being and also the active cure attempt being performed. You see, shadows do attack the one casting the image, yes, but they can only destroy or devour that which is compatible with them. This is the cure process. If the being that is possessed by pride were to willfully halt habitual identifications and simply observe, he would see that the only aspects being attacked are the ones it bears in him as imperfections. Also, they are being shown to him for the purpose of redemption, that is, for acceptance of such imperfections, first, and then for their transmutation into their perfect original, before it became sick. However, what prevents this from happening is the fear of exposure that emerges from the prideful self-image identification. If it is supposed to be perfect, no exposure of its imperfections can occur. So consequently, the shameful shadows are dissociated by it as, like stated before, a completely external enemy, when they are, in fact, reflections of its own nature. All of us, with no exceptions, have aspects we are ashamed of and aspects we are proud of. None of us would enjoy seeing our shameful aspects exposed, and all of us, contrarily, enjoy seeing our prideful aspects praised. These are natural reactions of the identification we carry. However, do note that I am not proposing that we here should have no pride nor shame at all. No. What I am stating is that pride and shame can only reflect each other in the world's mirror if there is a big enough distance between them in this realm. So, and now I am going to present my individual realization, so it is only worth as much as that, the therapeutic process that I realized that was being applied was for one to accept that all that we actually see the shadows do to us, not to be confused with what the shadows want us to believe that they do, is a reflection in the world's mirror at a certain distance of something of ours that we either are yet unconscious of or that we deny in ourselves. Once we accept that this is a reflection of something of ours, and once we adjust, through contemplation of our own inner worlds, just the right amount of pride, self-love, and the right amount of shame, selflessness, then the distance between the shadow and its caster is diminished, and so also diminishes its power. This is because the false part of us that was actually casting the shadow in front of us was understood, accepted, and consequently redeemed. In the end, therefore, the only aspect that the shadow was able to destroy in the process was the one it was compatible with, an identification with a falsehood or a sin. For more on this idea of the shadows being part of the therapeutic cure, please refer to the presentation named Metaphors of Tumors. Now, going back a bit, we must also understand that although they actually have no choice but to be the shadows they are, any and all beings, regardless of their nature, will strive for their own survival. This is why hoax expectations have been given by them. If a shadow tells you, for example, your salvation will come when a bird sits on the branch and sips the flower right at noon, and you come to believe it, 
you will always be looking for such details and consequently disregarding any contextual outline. So the believer in the details will become incapable, or at the very least impaired, of observing the actual context for what it is, regardless of the details involved, because his mind will always be searching for bird, branch, flower, and noon in conjunction. One day he will see a bird and will follow it. Then the bird sits on the branch. It feels the excitement of his prophecy coming closer. But then the bird flies away and does not touch the flower. Or maybe it does, but it's not noon. Frustration ensues in one way or another. And maybe the bird was carrying a message for salvation, but it had to be observed in its complete outline and context, like a true myth has to, to be read. An even worse scenario for the believer in such an expectation would be to train a bird, to set up a branch, to place a flower, and to time it right. Then, to enact the expectation sending the trained bird to sit on the branch and eat from the flower artificially placed there at exactly noon. All this show set up for the believers in that particular detailed expectation. What then? Well, they will all consequently believe that they have been or will be saved just by seeing that. They will rejoice in confirmation. And they carry on under the unconscious influences of their reflections without being healed because if they had, the shadows would have been gone and they, like all beings, want to survive. And they can only do so by deceit. Shadows have long understood that they need to deceive to continue existing, and their main goal is to convert their caster into behaving like one of them, because if they manage to do so, then they will be reflected too, and multiply, like a mirror in front of a mirror. This was also addressed in the contemplation named Mirror. Ultimately, however, I would individually say that we need to realize that what affects us from the shadow's actions is only what is compatible with them. They can only devour that which is theirs. To Caesar's what is Caesar's. What is not metaphorically Caesar's is originally living, but fell sick, and in the process of healing created that seemingly overpowering Caesar to remove what is dead like leeches will clean a wound of poison because it's their nature and purpose. And all that is left afterwards is living. <laughs>